Well, good morning. I guess we'll start as soon as the crowd stops streaming in. And uh, but we want to welcome all of you who are here this morning uh, to Fellowship Baptist. And we're so glad you can be here this morning as we uh, sing to the Lord and praise his name and sing, uh, declaring that our God reigns. Let's stand and sing together. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, good news, announcing peace, proclaiming news of happiness, our God our God reigns, our God reigns, our God reigns, our God reigns, our God reigns. He had no stately form, he had no majesty that we should be. Drawn to him, he was despised, and we took no account of him. Yet now he reigns with the most high. Our God reigns, our God reigns, our God reigns. Our God reigns, our God reigns, our God reigns, our God reigns, our God reigns. Out of the tomb, he came with grace and majesty. He is alive, he is alive, God loves us so, see here his hands, his feet, his side, yes we know, he is alive, our God reigns, our God reigns. Our God reigns, our God reigns, our God reigns. You may be seated, please. This morning, we have a new song to learn. Very easy, very easy chorus, very easy verse. But we'd like you to listen to it as we sing this morning. If you love him, lift your hands in praise. If you love him, stand with us today. If you love him, lift your voice and shout the glory of his name. If you love him, open up your mouth. If you love him, let his praise ring out. Every nation, sing for joy and come together our God is strong and mighty we will not be silent we will declare your name we will declare your name and we will tell the world there is no other we are not ashamed 
We will declare your name. We will declare your name. And we will tell the world there is no other. Jesus, we declare your name. Let's sing that again. If you love him, lift your hands in praise. If you love him, stand with us today. If you love him, lift your voice and shout the glory of his name. If you love him, open up your mouth. If you love him, let his praise ring out. Every nation, sing for joy and come together. Let's stand. Our God is strong and mighty. We will not be silent. We will declare your name. We will declare your name. And we will tell the world there is no other. We are not ashamed. We will declare your name. We will declare your name. And we will tell the world there is no other Jesus, we declare your name. Once more, and if you love him, lift your hands in praise. If you love him, stand with us today. If you love him, lift your voice and shout the glory of his name. If you love him, Open up your mouth, if you love him, let his praise ring out. Every nation, sing for joy and come together. Our God is strong and mighty. We will not be silent, we will declare your name. We will declare your name. And we will tell the world there is no other. We are not ashamed. We will declare your name. We will declare your name. And we will tell the world there is no other. Jesus, we declare your name. We will declare your name we will declare your name and we will tell the world there is no other we are not ashamed we will declare your name we will declare your name and we will tell the world there is no other jesus we declare your name. Let's continue praising, singing joyfully together. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around the center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and fountain, flowering meadow, flashing sea. Chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. 
Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou our Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, today, I'd like to just welcome sp uh, specifically anybody that's new here. So if you are new and you can put up your hand, uh, we would like to get you a contact card. And if you can fill that information out, and please make sure that you print really carefully because I have to read it, and then I can contact you. And then if you take that contact card to the info booth, we have a, a gift especially for you. All right, uh, today's announcements are pretty short. Tonight, we have leaders for FBC. If you are interested in becoming a part of our leadership uh, team, we are planning some things for the future. And uh, if you want to be a part of that, we're meeting at 6.30 tonight, and Pastor Brent will be leading that. Uh, Thursday, if uh, you're in the college and career age, there's a dessert night being put on specially for you. Uh, that'll be at my place at uh, 7 o'clock. Or actually get there at 6 and you can have supper. Next Sunday, Steve Jones, our president of the FBC, uh, will be here and he will be speaking. So make sure you come for that. And in the future in June, we have the Compassion Car Rally and they're selling the cars outside there to raise money for Compassion. And you can whittle away on that piece of wood and see if it wins the rally. It's a pretty exciting time. There's also going to be a barbecue at that point. Uh, make sure you read your bulletin. There's other pieces of information in there that you might be interested in. And that's it. Wow. Short today. Let's uh, have the ushers come forward and we'll give thanks for the offer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that you've given us another day to rejoice and be glad in it and uh, in you. And we worship you today and we praise you and, and we ask that you bless the word of God to our hearts and that we'd be able to take something home for this week to uh, improve our our way of living and our, our relationship with you and just uh, put something on our heart today that will in return bless you. We also thank you for the gifts that you give us, for the jobs that you give us. And we pray for those also that are looking for jobs that you would supply one for them. And today we just want to return back to you what you give to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
This morning we're going to do something a little different with our singing time, and we're going to use it as time to prepare our hearts to reflect on the goodness and the mercy of God and to bring before him things that are weighing down on our hearts, on our minds, things we need to confess. Maybe just even simply confess that we're overworked, that we're hanging on to too much anxiety, that we're not leaving our cares before the Lord, asking them. The Bible reminds us. So join with me now as I read Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word, my soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his This morning, as we sing together, we declare the goodness of God, we declare our weakness for Him. We sing this chorus together. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. Let's sing that again. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus, I've forgotten the words that you have spoken. Promises that burned within my heart have now grown dim. With a doubting heart I follow the paths of of earthly wisdom. Forgive me for my unbelief. Renew the fire again. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. I have built an altar where I've worshipped things of man. I have taken journeys that have drawn me far from you. Now I am returning 
to your mercies ever flowing. Pardon my transgressions, help me love you again. Sing together now. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. I have longed to know you and all your tender mercies like a river of forgiveness ever flowing without end. So I bow my heart before you in the goodness of your presence, your grace forever shining like a beacon in the night. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy. Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy on me. Father, in the quietness and the stillness, our hearts are bowed before you. Open before you, ready to receive your mercy. My Jesus, I love Thee, I know Thou art mine. For Thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, Savior, art thou? If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me. And purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. And love thee for wearing the thorns on thy breast. If ever I love thee, my Jesus. I'll love thee in life, I will love thee in death, and praise thee as long as the land the 
Test me, bread, and say when the death do lies cold on my breath. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, Jesus now. Let's stand. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with the glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus takes now. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest spring, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, His covenant, His blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. I've had an exciting week. I got a new phone. And I discovered that it has a, a feature where I don't have to type anymore. I just talk to the phone. It types for me. I'm no longer fearful of long text messages from Tina. Uh, I no longer have to pretend I know short code. You know, like, you know, like text code, like all these abbreviations and so on. The danger of pretending you know those is people respond with them too, and I'm trying to figure out what does this mean. Anyway, um, it, it's uh, there's a lot of neat things in in technology that can be very helpful, but that microphone thing for me that's going to save me so much like pecking time. It's really good. Uh, anything exciting happened to you this week? It's been a good week, and uh, we praise God for his goodness. Uh, Mark and Ev are heading south uh, for a little wedding vacation. 
their daughter's getting married. Is it next Saturday? Next Saturday. So God's blessing on you guys as, as you uh, travel and on your daughter and her new husband. That will be awesome. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we just come before you this morning and we know, Father, that sometimes we, we wander like wandering sheep. And as one of the songs that we sang talked about, just that coming back to you and uh, renewing that closeness, that intimacy with you. And Father, there's nothing that will create a bigger hole in our life than your absence. And there's nothing that will fill us fuller than your presence. And today, we want to walk hand in hand with you. We want, Father, to have hearts that are wide open to all you want to say to us, to all you want to do in us, to all you want to do through us. And so we Pray that you would have mercy this morning on us. And as we sang that song about standing before the throne, and I couldn't help but think that perhaps our greatest consciousness of that time will be how you have taken us from what we were to being able to stand in your presence and fellowship with you forever and ever. And so we, we thank you, Father, that, that you love us, that you continue to renew us day by day, and your mercies are new every morning. We invite you, Father, to speak to our hearts this morning, and we pray for uh, all of those who are connected with our congregation, we ask that you would minister to their needs and help us as a community to minister to one another. We pray for the other churches in the city who are preaching the word of God, sharing the gospel of Christ. And we ask that you would bring much fruit uh, to the gospel. We pray for our own church, Father, as we look at the area of evangelism and touching our community. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to be humble enough to admit that we, we have a long way to go, and there is so much more that uh, we could do if we were walking in obedience to your word and in the fullness of your spirit. So help us, Father, to be people who are on our knees constantly praying without ceasing that your strength, your power, your love would be so present in us that we could actually carry the gospel in a way that would attract others to Christ. I ask, Father, for your blessing now as we hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the title of the message this morning is Anyone Stressed? Anyone Stressed? And I would be surprised if any of us could say, that could never apply to me. I'm never stressed. It's, it's, a, it's pretty much an inevitable part of life. And uh, I'm going to talk a bit about burnout today. And so before I actually get your, your, this is going to be a different message than, than usual because it's going to take me a while to get to actually talking from Scripture. I got a lot of preamble this morning. I usually have a little preamble, maybe a paragraph. I got a couple of pages of preamble today, okay? Um, and uh, if I ask the question, how many of you suspect that you have experienced burnout at one time or another, you don't have to raise your hand, but... I suspect there would be a number of people who would, who would put up their hand. And it may be a bit of an overused expression, uh, but it's very real, and it's a serious problem for many people, including 
Many believers gasp. Can believers experience burnout? Uh, yes, we can and we do. And even if you're not a classical case of burnout, and I hope many of you are not or most of you are not, uh, you can probably identify with some of the markers, some of the things that kind of are telltale signs that a person is either suffering burnout or maybe in danger of burnout. And, uh, we're, and so by doing that, 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 can, that can help us anyway because not all stress is burnout, but most of us experience stress to varying uh, degrees. And uh, handling it is probably similar in, in all cases. Um, so today we're going to look at some of those indicators and uh, then we're going to look at a burnt out profit and uh, then talk about some treatments or remedies or whatever you want to call it. And uh, if you're feeling like, you know, Pastor, <laughs> this is really timely uh, because I'm burning out right now, <laughs> you know, I, I, I can feel myself on a downward trajectory and uh, if that's the case, I would encourage you to let God speak to your heart today because he, he knows your situation. He knows your being. Uh, he knows your need. And also let the people of God minister to you. Uh, the last thing that a person who is experiencing this needs is isolation, uh, to just kind of go away and not want to be with people. But that's usually a sign. Um, and after the service today, people will be available to pray with you uh, if you want that. So I want to start with the risk, the risk of burnout. Uh, are there signs to look for? You know, virtually all of us have been wiped. You know, we use that expression. We're just, how are you doing? Oh, I'm just wiped. You know, I'm just so tired. You know, we've all experienced that, and and that isn't necessarily burnout. Uh, that is something that you go through those periods in your life where through almost inevitable circumstances you, you find yourself in a situation where uh, you've just been pressed for a long period of time. And, and the solution for that is sometimes it's just a chance to stop and uh, recharge. You know, kind of like the computer, pull the plug and then reboot. It solves a lot of, a lot of problems. Um, but here I have, uh, from that wonderful resource, the Internet, I just Googled burnout. And, of course, there's tons of stuff on there. But I found this one interesting. It was kind of a diagnostic of evaluating whether you are, in fact, suffering burnout or you're at high risk for burnout. And uh, so listen to these questions. It's in the context of somebody who is in the workplace. So if you're, if you're not in the workplace, you might have to kind of take the questions and, and, and you know, massage them a little bit. Um, but here are the questions. And the answers are this, not at all. In other words, this, that doesn't apply to me in any circumstance at all. Or rarely, yeah, sometimes, but not very often. Sometimes, and then often, and then very often. And in this case, the worst answer is very often. <laughs> Okay, so if your if your answer is very often, uh, and it, in the online section you just filled these out, and at the end it gave you a score, and then it gave you kind of you know that range thing, and if you're in the high range, you know that you are in severe risk of burnout. So here it is: Do you feel run down and drained of physical or emotional energy? So the question, the answers would be not at all, rarely, sometimes, often, very often. So I'm not going to repeat repeat that every time, just the questions. Uh, do you find that you are prone to negative thinking about your job? Do you find that you are harder and less sympathetic with people than perhaps they deserve? Do you find yourself getting easily irritated by small problems or by your coworkers and team? Do you feel misunderstood or unappreciated by your coworkers? Do you feel you have no one to talk to? Do you feel that you're achieving less than you should? Do you feel uh, under an unpleasant level of pressure to succeed? Do you feel that you're not getting what you want out of your job? Do you feel that you are in the wrong organization or the wrong profession? Should you be a golfer, for example? Uh, 
Are you becoming frustrated with parts of your job? Do you feel that organizational politics or bureaucracy frustrate your ability to do your job? Do you feel that there is more work to do than you practically have the ability to do? Do you feel that you do not have time to do many of the things that are important to doing a good quality job? Do you find that you do not have time to plan as much as you would like to? I forget the, uh, the URL, but if you want to take the test, I could probably find it again for you. Um, but uh, these questions kind of uh, fit well with this definition of burnout. Burnout is a condition produced by working too hard or too long in a high pressure situation. So there's, a, there's time involved here. This isn't like that kind of you know, big push, that one time push to get something done. This is something that is prolonged. So you're working too hard or too long under too much pressure. Uh, that's what burnout is, or at least that's what produces it. Um, and so, as I mentioned, later we're going to look at an Old Testament case of burnout, so burnout is, is not new. But I do believe it's increasing, especially in places like Fort McMurray, maybe Alberta generally. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of pressure in, in this province and in this city. And it drains people. It drains them physically, it drains them emotionally, it drains them mentally and it drains them spiritually. Um, it's not something that just hits the high-powered CEO who is handling uh, million and billion dollar budgets. It can hit the unemployment person who doesn't have any budget to handle. Uh, it can hit young moms who have three preschoolers in their home. It can hit missionaries who are on the foreign field and somewhat isolated from other people. There is no kind of uh, prototypical burnout person. It can hit anyone uh, in given circumstances. So what's it look like and what are some of the symptoms? And uh, uh, one source uh, suggests that the symptoms of burnout come in three stages. The first or is, this is a very clever word, the early stage. All right, the early stage. And in the early stage, there is fatigue, irritability, lethargy, and loss of enthusiasm. So there, it's official. All of us are in uh, the early stages of burnout, right? <laughs> fatigue, irritability, lethargy, and loss of enthusiasm. The implication of that is that uh, the, the healthy norm is to be, because if that's burnout, the healthy norm has to be that we are energetic, uh, that we are contented, and that we are excited about life. That fits very well with the spirit-filled life, you know? In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, where it talks about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God has a design for people, and that's it. That is God's design for every one of us. And so it's interesting that whether you read secular sources or, or Christian sources, uh, they can see what's the healthy norm in life as far as an emotional space is concerned. Now, so in the early stage, there may be physical distress, headaches, muscle ache, uh, stomach upset, uh, things like that. Appetite may change. People who use drug and alcohol, even uh, even medicinal drugs, prescription drugs, will find themselves increasing in their intake. Um, uh, some of the things that come along with this are feelings of inadequacy and incompetence and frustration that work, life just isn't working out as it should. You know, things are not, the universe is not unfolding as it should for in, in this person's opinion. And uh, there's a sense of being trapped, a sense of just feeling like I'm, Life is kind of caving in on me and I have no place to go. That's the early stage. In, in the intermediate stage, it becomes much more serious. Um, that's serious enough, but the person becomes withdrawn. Uh, they become silent, even when you speak to them directly. Uh, now, this is 
typical of husbands, so don't be careful of how you use this, wives. But uh, even when you speak to them directly, they don't respond. Uh, or they may give an abrupt or an even hostile reaction in a situation that just that's just out of out of proportion. Uh, physical symptoms uh, may include prolonged colds. How long have I had this cold? <laughs> <clears throat> Shortness of breath, shallow breathing patterns, severe fatigue, weight gain or loss. Um, then in the advanced stages, the person just gets to the point where they're convinced that they're no good. They'll just say things like completely negative about themselves. They're no good, they're useless, they're worthless, uh, they don't care about anybody or anything. And negativity and withdrawal become so much to the fore that the person almost, you just don't want to be around them. They, they can become kind of obnoxious. To, to be around. An almost total lack of energy for work or personal responsibilities. Just can't get out of bed in the morning. There's just no motive, motivation to do anything. And uh, they may blame others for their errors. I find a lot of us do that whether we're burnt out or not. <laughs> um, but that's what the, this person said. And then uh, fatigue may completely immobilize them. And here's a serious one for Christians. Even their values and views and beliefs may start to, to waver or be impacted when a person gets to this low point. What types of people are especially prone to burnout? And I hope if you fall in these categories, you don't say, Pastor, why are you picking on me? But perfectionists, those with very high standards for themselves, and others, uh, those who feel the need to control people and situations. So perfectionists are a little more vulnerable to burnout. Here's another type of person, people who are oriented toward others. Well, this may sound strange, but people who are kind of others oriented. Uh, people with a strong need to be liked or admired. So they're always trying to accommodate everybody. Um, they're extremely sensitive to, to criticism, and uh, they're generous to everybody except themselves. And so they're, they're others-oriented, which can be a good thing, but suddenly you're just being kind of pulled along by that, and you can't keep up. There's just too many people to be generous to, and so you wear yourself out um, on behalf of others. And then uh, people lacking assertive interpersonal skills. Uh, people lacking assertive interpersonal skills. In other words, a person who is kind of a pushover. They find it difficult to say no to requests. Uh, you know, you just know if you're looking for something to be done, well, I might as well ask them because I know I'm going to get a yes. Um, people who find it hard to disagree without feeling guilty and the need to apologize. Uh, so, you know, if the person, you have a disagreement, and you immediately, your immediate inclination is, oh, I've got to go and apologize because I disagreed with them. Uh, they don't know how to basically express themselves in an assertive way. Uh, people who personalize every conflict or every difference, and they're not able to separate their ideas from their person. In other words, if their idea is rejected, then they're rejected. So if somebody has kind of shot down their idea, they are shot down as a person. Those are some of the things this person said. You can take it or leave it. Um, and these are quite general. But a person in bur burnout is seriously or completely hindered uh, from performing or from functioning due to a loss of energy and enthusiasm. Again, this is over a long period of time. This isn't when you've driven from Newfoundland uh, for 40 hours and not stopped, and you get here and you wonder why you're tired. Okay? This is, this is over a prolonged period of time. This is a pattern in your life. So let's now look at the reality of burnout by looking at a biblical example, and we're going to look at Elijah. And what's remarkable about Elijah is that he's a very unlikely candidate for burnout. Um, and this in itself is very revealing. Think of a person right now in your mind a person who is a, a very busy person with lots of responsibilities who you think is unlikely to ever burn out. You know, you got the picture of this person, they're, they're a high performer and so on, and you think that person 
will never suffer burnout because, because, because. If you, if I'd given that in a direction in Elijah's day, Elijah would be the first person that would come to mind for a lot of people. That Elijah, there's no possible way that man of God uh, will ever burn out. Well, in First Kings chapter 17, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to be spending most of the time and doing a lot of reading in First Kings uh, 17, 18, and 19. So if It'll be on the screen too, but if you'd like to follow along your Bible, that's where we'll be. First Kings chapter 17. So in, in verse 1, it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. So he wasn't predicting a one-week drought. He was predicting a uh, drought that would last for years and it would only stop uh, when Elijah said it was going to stop or told him he had been told by God it was going to stop. And this actually happened. A terrible drought started. And uh, in the midst of that drought, he, he announced to a widow that uh, for her and her family that uh, her supplies wouldn't run out. Um, chapter, or same chapter, verse 10. It says, So he arose and went to Seraphath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called out and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord God, Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. So they're desperate. They've got nothing. And she's convinced in this famine nothing's coming. And, and so it, death is inevitable. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But first, <laughs> make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward." Make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that he spoke to by Elijah. So he predicts the drought. He predicts the supply of food from God. Uh, he's batting two for two here. Um, and then uh, it goes on. After this, verse 17, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. In other words, he died. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. So there's obviously some sin in her life that she recalled and she felt she was being punished for that sin because this was a man of God and she had already seen what he could do. And she thought this was judgment on her. And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourned by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And uh, so, this is, we could say, this is a prophet on a roll. Uh, he's really got things going here. And uh, you're not expecting uh, anything to change that. Uh, in chapter 18, verse 1 and 2, it says, and many, After many days, the Lord, uh, <clears throat> and many days the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. So he's a prophet who has just performed a number of miracles and prophecies. 
and uh, now he's given a direction from God, and he immediately uh, obeys what God tells him to do. When it's a little bit of a roundabout getting to uh, Ahab, but when he does get to him, he's bold. Verse 17, when Ahab saw Elijah, uh, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? <laughs> and he, he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have in your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. And so he's, he's bold uh, in, in uh, inter interacting with the king. And then he challenges King Ahab, really, but the pagan prophets that, that uh, are surrounded the religion of Baal. And uh, in chapter uh, verse 19, it says, Now therefore send and gather uh, all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Azra who eat at Jezebel's table. So these are, these are big, pretty big odds. You have Elijah and then you have 850 pagan prophets. And uh, I'm not going to read it today, but you're probably very familiar with the scenario that Elijah then sets up where you're there to have a bull and an altar and Elijah's to have a bull and an altar, and, uh, but there's, there's no fire to be provided. The fire is to come either from Baal or from the god of Elijah. And uh, so you have this contest of uh, where's the fire going to come from and th this would be an evidence that this miraculous uh, bringing of fire to consume the sacrifice would be an evidence that that God was the true and living God. It's a rather protracted affair where uh, the prophets of Baal spend all day uh, doing all kinds of things, trying to get this fire to come down, and they're screaming and they're yelling and they're cutting themselves and so on. And uh, it actually gets a little humorous at times, uh, for Elijah in uh, verse 27, because Elijah kind of lets them go first. He lets them have at it, because uh, it would have been kind of anticlimactic to do it the other way. Uh, in, any, in any case, because uh, they would have been gone, <laughs> uh, so there would be no contest. Uh, but anyway, in verse 27 it says, And at noon Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god, speaking of Baal because they've been saying, oh, Baal, answer us, answer us, and, and there was no voice, and no one answered. And so it says, either he is musing, he's kind of thinking, or he's relieving himself, he's in the washroom, or he's on a journey, maybe he's out of town, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. And Elijah's just kind of like digging, 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 and, uh, you know, very relaxed too. Not a burnout type of guy. He's very relaxed. And then, of course, uh, what happens when he, uh, when it's his turn, of course, he pours water upon water on the sacrifices and the trenches around it and so on. Verse uh, 37, and then he says, Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed like there was no drum roll, <laughs> there was no drum roll, no pause for effect. Elijah prayed, and it says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and slaughtered them there. Uh, just total unrestrained victory for Elijah. Um, despite this, all of this was happening, there was a tremendous emotional and spiritual strain on this prophet of God. There's eight, 850 guys there, and this has been, a, and although he enjoyed it, and although he had great victory, um, and then he followed this up in uh, uh, verse 46. It says, And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Uh, biblical commentary suggests that's about a marathon, you know, 25, 26 miles. Uh, so you have that. So to sum it up, we have this spiritual giant of a man, Elijah, fresh off one of the greatest victories recorded in the biblical record. 
there's a lot of great stuff in scripture, but this is like if you were making a movie, this would be in it. This would this was very dramatic. And uh, as so often happens, great success is followed by great letdown. If you haven't experienced that, it, it's it's almost always true. You get high, there's no place to go <laughs> but down. You cannot stay at this level for a, a prolonged period of time. And so Elijah is going to experience that. Uh, it happens in a kind of odd way. Verse 2 of chapter 19, then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, like she was a follower of Baal, and she was not excited about uh, when she heard all the prophets had been killed by Elijah. And she sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So this is a death threat uh, from Jezebel. Um, you would kind of expect Elijah to say, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know, this little puny queen threatening me, doesn't she know? But that wasn't his reaction at all. Verse 3, it says, then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servants there. So his, his response in this situation was panic and fear, and he, he fled for his life. In verse 4, it says, But he went, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. He's physically and spiritually exhausted, and he's ready to pack it in. He's ready to die. And I want you to uh, note how God provides for him in this situation. And I know I covered this as an illustration in a message not that long ago but you might not have been here. <laughs> uh, but we're talking about this same thing, this, this uh, prescription for just being completely de depleted spiritually, physically, and emotionally. Verse 5, And he lay down and slept under the broom tree, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. So what you see there is a prescription. You see first rest, sleep, and then you see food, nourishment. Now verse 6, And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on, a hot, uh, on hot stones and a jar of water, and he ate and drank and lay down again. So food, rest and food, food and rest. This is the prescription uh, for Elijah. And then in verse 8, it says, and he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. So he has food for his journey. So the prescription here is a good diet, eat well, uh, proper rest, get to bed, and proper devotion. Because I'm just associating, I may be reading into this a little bit, but... 40 days. Do you remember somebody else who went 40 days without food? Jesus did. This is, this is a, a, an interesting number in Scripture, but in any case, the point I'm making here is fasting. So after being refreshed, he then fasted. And in a time of fasting, fasting is not simply going without food. Fasting is going without food so that you can focus more on your relationship with God, spending more time in prayer. And so it was proper diet, proper rest, and proper devotion uh, that was what is being used to restore this great prophet of God who had gone from such a high to almost a suicide watch. Um, there's another thing here uh, that I think led to his burnout. And I think this happens to a lot of people too. The sense that you're the only one the sense that there's nobody kind of in your corner <laughs> spiritually. You're kind of out there just in this isolated uh, situation. And it's a lie. Chapter 19, verse 10. It says, um, 
he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So it's been a bad time for Israel, and there's been a lot, a lot of things going on, and a lot of the prophets have been killed. But Elijah is exaggerating the situation to the point where he's it. He's alone. Everything depends on him. That is a tremendous amount of pressure. And so if you are feeling that, that you are alone and it's basically all up to you, uh, that's, a, that's a stressor in itself. And so God speaks to, Joan, uh, to Elijah in his loneliness. Verse 11, and he said, this is the Lord said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and, tore, and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? So God meets Elijah and he speaks to him. And then he asks him this question. Elijah, what are you doing here in this cave? Hiding. Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah has... An answer. He goes back into his woe is me speech. And I'm the only one, and so on. Verse 14. And uh, what does God respond to God to Elijah's woe is me speech? Verse 15. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of uh, Abel Mahola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. <laughs> What's God essentially saying to Elijah at this point? Elijah, you've been refreshed. You've been revived. Get back to work. <laughs> you know, you're a prophet. Go and anoint people. And uh, so it's really good. And then he dispels the I am alone myth. Verse 18. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he says, Elijah, not only are you not the only one, I have 7,000 others. And you thought that prophets of Baal were numerous. I have 7,000. You know, the, uh, Elisha, and we'll get to Elisha in a minute. In 2 Kings chapter 6, you remember that scene where Elisha is surrounded by armies and so on, and uh, he says to his prophet, uh, or to his servant, there are more with us than with them. So it's interesting that Elijah had this feeling of defeat, and his successor has this feeling of God is everywhere. <laughs> you know, uh, we're not alone. And of course, he asked God to reveal that to his servant, and he did. Uh, and of course, he, speaking of Elisha, he enlists this young man in uh, verse 19. It says, So he departed from there and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was, was with the twelfth. Elisha passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. So Elijah finds Elisha, and he's been directed to anoint him to, to be in, in Elijah's place. And uh, you remember the issue of Elisha wanting the double blessing. Uh, and Elisha turned out to be a greater prophet than Elijah. So here is Elijah, you know, concerned about, you know, it's all going to end with him. And God says, you haven't seen anything yet. You know, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Amen? He doesn't need us. <laughs> He'll use us. Uh, but he's not hanging on pins and needles, wondering if we're going to come through for him. And then, how many of you have seen Chariots of Fire? 
Well, Elijah was like the original chariots of fire. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 2.11. Uh, and as they went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. That was Elijah and Elisha. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Do you remember Elijah's promise to Elisha? If you see me go up, the double portion will fall on you. Okay, so reducing burnout. Now this would be a good time to turn this into a workshop, but we don't have time. It would also be a good thing to do because I'm, I'm perfectly aware that I'm probably the last person in the world that should be giving this message, to which my wife would attest. Um, so I encourage you to go home and talk with somebody who really knows something, and that would be your spouse or your friends. Uh, but seriously, talk about this. It's something we don't talk about. We all pretend, you know, we all, how you doing? Just great. You know, I've gotten people into saying just, just borderline phenomenal. Phenomenal's here and I'm just above it. Uh, that sort of thing. But you know, we're really a bunch of liars. And we can be dying inside and we're still going to, you know, kind of make it pretty on the outside. And uh, you may be there today. And I would encourage you to talk to someone. If you want to talk to me, uh, I'll, get, I'll give you to uh, June. Uh, and she'll counsel you. Um, but uh, clearly, life is not sustainable uh, when we're in overdrive physically, emotionally, and even spiritually. It's not sustainable. God, you know, I remember hearing a pastor years ago, and he was, you know, waxing eloquent about working hard and so on, and, and he said this. He was about 30 years old. He said, I'd rather burn out at 30 than rust out at 80. And everybody just applauded and applauded. That is wrong thinking. God doesn't want anybody to burn out at 30. You know? I don't think. You know, there may be some that he, he just has a special mission for. But the norm is that we're in for the long haul. We're not in for just the sprint. We're in for the marathon. And so that, that requires sustainability. So we need to care for ourselves physically. We need to eat right, uh, rest. We need recreation. Yes, you can take vacation. And uh, we need exercise. And need I remind you that you need sleep. Turn off the TV. How many times do we watch an extra hour when it would be much better invested in sleep? Um, we need to reject the it all depends on me lie and look for others to share the work for others that you can teach and train look for your Elisha look for your Elisha look for somebody that you can invest in because you're not going to be here forever you're not going to be involved in in this ministry forever and so we need and this pastor Mark is really conscious of this and and really pushing on this and I and I love it and pray for Pastor Mark that he doesn't burn himself out <laughs> pray that he gets enough uh, uh, others uh, going so that, that he's not just run ragged um, and I'm serious in that Pastor Mark you work really hard and I I'm conscious of that and I appreciate it but get your rest and um, look for others to share the work and ultimately the restoration we need comes from God um, we can we can get counsel from others, but ultimately we need to seek God for encouragement. We need to seek God for direction. We need to seek God for release. <laughs> you know, sometimes we just need to be released from something, and uh, you don't need the senior pastor's approval. You don't need uh, the board of the chair of elders, the chair of elders board's approval. You need to be at peace with God that that you're doing what is pleasing to Him. Meditate on how deeply he loves you and invest in the relationships that God has already given you. Resist the, the temptation to crawl into the cave, you know, and hide away. Uh, invest. Um, find things you enjoy and guard them. You know what I wrote in brackets here, Pastor Mark? Squash. <laughs> find things that you enjoy and guard them. I enjoy squash. It's it's insanely pathetic how infrequently I get out. It's so bad that 
Mark doesn't even want to play me anymore. It's it's like it's like he's just hitting the ball against the wall. There's nobody hitting it back. Uh, I have to get him to look for Gene Doby or somebody to play that can give him a run. Another thing is focus on important things, not just on urgent things. That's a message I need so much. Focus on important things, not just on urgent things. Because if we don't focus on the important things, the urgent things are always going to crowd them out, and the important things are going to be neglected. For me, I need, I need a sense of purpose and a sense of progress. That's what I need to sustain me lots of times. I need to, to uh, have an idea that, that things are moving forward. And uh, see ministry. If you're involved in ministry, and if you're not, I trust you will be. But see ministry as a great privilege and not as, as an unpleasant responsibility. See it as a great privilege to serve God. So... As I mentioned earlier, God knows your situation exactly this morning. And as uh, I'll invite the worship team to kind of make their way up here. And I invite you to come for prayer this morning. There will be some of us here available to pray with you. But, you know, you could be in, you know, there, there, there's every place in between. But the extremes could be, one is you could be on the mountaintop this morning. You can come in here. And you're just flying high <laughs> and uh, just enjoying your walk with God and, and, and everything in your life is, is really going well. I would invite you to come up. You don't need anybody to pray with you. Just come up and spend some time praising God that you're in that space this morning. But maybe you're also uh, here and uh, you're not on the mountaintop. You're kind of in the valley. And a lot of the things that have been said this morning, you can say, wow. Uh, that really speaks to me. I would encourage you to just come and, and just share with one of the people who are here and say, would you just pray for me? Uh, and if you have something specific you'd like them to pray about, just share that, um, and we'll do that. So just come as, as we sing, and uh, June's coming up, and I think there will be some others come up to be available for prayer. Let's pray. Father, I just pray right now that you would... Uh, that you would finish this service in a way that will be of maximum ministry to everyone here. In Jesus' name, amen. This is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. Let's stand. All I have within me, I give you praise. All that I adore is in you. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm away, Lord have your way in me. This is my desire, to honor you. Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me, I give you praise. All that I adore is in you. Lord, I give you my heart, give you my soul. I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way in me.
no doubt there are adjustments that every one of us have to make in the coming week uh, for various reasons. And uh, so spend time with God, make those adjustments. Uh, there's, I don't think there's a sign-up list today for anything. So if, if you feel compelled to sign up, you can make your own list today. But have a great week. Uh, if you can come out tonight for the leadership time at 6.30, that'd be great. God bless you. We will declare your name. We will declare your name. And we will tell the world there is no other. We are not ashamed. We will declare your name. We will declare your name, and we will tell the world there is no other. Jesus, we declare your name. If you love him, lift your hands in praise. If you love him, stand with us today. If you love him, Lift your voice and shout the glory of his name. If you love him, open up your mouth. If you love him, let his praise ring out. Every nation, sing for joy and come together. Our God is strong and mighty. We will not be silent. We will declare your name. We will declare your name. And we will tell the world there is no other. We are not ashamed. We will declare your name. We will declare your name. And we will tell the world there is no other Jesus we